Right. So hello, Mar Marilyn, and thanks for making time for us to have this conversation. Um, I would love to start by, by you telling a little bit about your journey of how I know you now live at Findhorn, where I'm um, working with Findhorn College, where we have a connection because I, I used to work there before um, you moved there. Um, and yeah, rather than me introducing you, I'd, I'd love for you to tell a little bit your story. How, how did you um, get interested in, in the whole integral framework and, and what made you feel that cities is where you wanted to give um, your focus to, to the integral story? Okay, thank you, Daniel. And it's a wonderful way to begin this year and this decade of 2020 with you. I have a interesting background around the integral framework that sort of grew naturally. My career started with developing individuals and then I started working with leaders and teams and organizations and sectors and then communities. And there was a point at which I had the experience of being invited to look at the city. And I, at first, I would call, since I live in Pintorn, an experience, this experience of a still small voice saying, this is where your next step is. And I thought, well, I don't do cities. My husband builds them. He was a building contractor. No. So I thought about it for a long time. I realized my whole career was about looking at and somehow catalyzing the development of human systems. So I said, okay, I'll look at the city as a human system. Well, that's a good idea. And I then began to realize that the fractal patterns that I had discovered in working at smaller scales of human systems also were all contained in the city. Mm -hmm. And the city itself as a human system is a large fractal pattern that at first I would say it's the human system writ large. And it's not just about a single human, but it's about how do we live together. So the patterns in the city represent the systems and relationships that we've learned as humans um, enable us to live together. Of course, over our histories, we have been more than successful and have expanded and encroached in the context in which we live, in, in our environments, which you're so much an expert about. And I realized that in order for cities to be uh, a fractal, they must in some way start to integrate, reintegrate with their ecology, with their environments. So uh, at about the time where I was looking at this, I had just graduated with going back to school um, and I did a doctorate in learning and leadership and self-organizing communities. It was an online community. I was working with Margaret Wheatley's work in the Britannic Community of Conversations. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, what that helped me to do was to see exactly how I could find the fractal patterns by listening to language, by listening to conversation, and waking up to consciousness and culture as being very important to being able to see the city as a whole. And when I discovered Ken Wilber's work in the integral model, I saw, okay, we've got consciousness and culture that go with the technology and the systems of the city, with the behaviors and the systems, and together these makes a very nice complementary four. And so the, the four, the, what Wilbur calls the, the tetra arising of these realities, helped me to be able to see the city um, as, first of all, whole, and then I was very interested in retaining that it be a living system, and that it be evolutionary, so that I recognized the city was very dynamic. So those were sort of my, quote, early beginnings of looking at the city through an integral lens and holding it and respecting it as a living evolutionary system. Yeah, I mean, there's so much that I would love to pick up on what you just said. Um, one of the... What you call the, the the fractal integration, yeah, like I it was one of the really big ins, insights for me when I was studying um, 
like after after being at Schumacher College doing the masters in holistic science, and during that time through contact with people like David Orr and John Todd and Nancy Jack Todd, realizing that the power of design and particularly the role of human intention in creating the world, um, kind of made me realize that we we really need to pay attention to the upstream end of design. And, and to some, some extent, that's what I see you do with this, this um, integral approach to the city, to, to, to bring in a bridge between how we bring forth the system through how we see the world, and how then what we bring forth also influences how we see the world. So this, this, this kind of feedback loop between yeah. design and worldview that is so often ignored and then we was, were surprised that we, we keep creating systems that are actually degenerative and not these self-propagating, evolving systems that fall into sync with the larger nestedness of wholeness, nature, life as a planetary process transforming. Um, yeah, does that resonate? <laughs> oh, yeah, to yeah, totally. Because after I went through this stage of... Um, discovering I had something I could say about the city, then uh, I was working in my small city in British Columbia, Abbotsford in Canada. Mm -hmm. And they asked me, I was part of the board of the Abbotsford Community Foundation, and they said, well, we, we want to sort of re-examine, well, how do we make grants this year, but what do we really know about our city? Mm -hmm. And I realized after I finished doing my doctoral work, I had answered the questions of uh, how to understand complexity uh, and, and look at, at community in very different ways, but I really didn't know how to take the message home. Mm -hmm. And once they asked that question, I said, oh, well, I, I think I might be able to help you answer that question, what we know about our city. And then I started to create um, new ways of finding the data that I could express to them in graphic form mm -hmm. about the value systems in the city about how the city was part of a context how the city itself had multiple intelligences and so when i finished this work then the first book started to emerge from me and in that first book i really identified that the city had multiple intelligences mm -hmm. and as you say the intelligences weren't just internal but the first set, I called it contexting intelligences. And they were intelligences for knowing the ecology of the setting of the city. They were about emergence and knowing that we were on an evolutionary path, that they had also an integral, this, this co-arising of consciousness, culture, behaviors, and systems, and that they were living. So many people forget there are generations in cities. And now it isn't just three generations. We can have five, and we might in some places be pushing those seven generations mm -hmm. that are contained in the city. I also looked at the intelligence of, of the individual, inner and outer, and the collective, the cultural and the social, and then a set of strategic intelligences. Mm -hmm. um, the first one I put there was the one of inquiry, mm -hmm. the not knowing. How can we inquire together about what it is that we want to know? Um, and that, just briefly, that that's really so at the center of when I, when I realized what is the process that would create regenerative cultures that are expressions of place in place, where 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 you have that dynamic again, where we are one at the same time. The cis like emergent properties of the system in our place, in our city, in our bioregion, and at the same time we're creative agents in it. That is is really like how how do we actively as regenerative cultures create cultures that um that adapt to place and express place as a like the whole biocultural uniqueness of where you live. But for me that that is um at the core of creating regenerative cultures. And um, yeah, th th that just came up when, when, when you said that. Yeah. And, and that's another place that we would resonate because um, the, uh, the inquiry, these intelligences, um, I, I went on afterwards. And so once 
we start to use inquiry, then we're starting to use a whole set of systems to know one another better, to develop the relationships, to listen to one another. And I did a lot of um, learning in it, um, prototyping in Abbotsford. And then as people started to learn about my work, they invited me to come to their places. Mm -hmm. And I'll, always I would start with, well, um, let, let us bring together what I call the four voices of the city. Mm -hmm. So the four voices would sit in inquiry and we would listen to what we know about each other what's working around here what's not working around here and what do we imagine for the future so we would call forth uh, what people were holding in their hearts but not necessarily sharing with each other and by listening to each other's stories um, people would who had known each other for 20 years say, i never knew that about you mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there was a heart opening as well as an opening of the intellect and we started to see how we made the particular culture that makes up our our different cities how did you how did you in this process how did you slow down the process enough that as you were asking people to tell stories about their place and, and what works what doesn't work it, i was just thinking it could so easily spiral into some kind of political discussion or a, a right. conflict of opinions so that there must be a skillful way of saying no no we're harvesting perspectives no. out of the collective yeah. beehive that is our community uh, yeah well, a really good example is the city i work with in Oklahoma in the States, Durant. Um, so they asked me to come and work with um, their community because some key leaders had actually been doing leadership development and organizational development. And then they looked at each other and said, what would happen if we did this for the community? So when they asked me, I said, well, I have to come and, um, and see if your community has the energy for an inquiry. And that's what I look for. I said, would you please convene for me the four voices of the city, the mm -hmm. citizens, the civic managers, the business innovators, and the third sector or the civil society. So we had about three or four people from each of those voices. Mm -hmm. And our first circle was just those three questions. Um, what's working around here? What's not working? What do you imagine for the future? And describe a story that, that connects you emotionally to the city. Mm -hmm. Out of that, we realized there was energy. There was energy for change, energy for moving forward. And then we created, they said to me, okay, let's, let's then give us a proposal for a long-term change process. And I gave them a proposal for 10 years, <laughs> which is not normal uh, to have a proposal for so long. Um, but the first uh, number of years really were about uh, convening series of dialogue circles, not only with the four voices, but around key themes. Mm -hmm. So we brought together uh, themes around the economy and education. We brought together themes around health and community. We brought together themes around um, culture and well-being. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these three, there, so there were three sets of, of themes but each circle had a different way of being assembled. First, we brought together thought leaders, and then we actually published what we discovered. And we published it in the community newspaper and on the website. Then we took it forward to the citizens and said, here's, here's what our thought leaders have said about it. Like, what have you got to say about it in small circles where they gave their own authentic feedback. It wasn't just, you know, um, parroting what they thought others had said. We, we republished that, and then we brought it to the policymakers. And so we said to the policymakers, here's what our thought leaders and our citizens have said about education and the economy. Um, what would prevent you from helping us to actually implement these ideas? And the policymakers were usually um, the ones that were the most surprised because so many policymakers work in very um, uh, circumstances where they're adversarial, mm -hmm. you know, parliamentarians in particular, uh, but also all kinds of bureaucracies work in very adversarial situations. And they would be held safe 
to express their own authentic views. Mm -hmm. When we found the, this combination of the thought leaders and the citizens and the policymakers, after uh, publishing them and then reconvening another set around other themes, over that, that took us three years. Took us, mm -hmm. took us, it, it wasn't instant. And, and I told the us is who's us in this case? Is it you and the the client in the city? Like how did you get the engagement? Like yes. to finance a process like that. Yeah, so so when I'm when so remember I said the invitation came from two leaders, so they were uh, obviously expressing energy. And I wanted to see where else was the energy in the city, and so did they, because they knew that they couldn't carry it just on their own. They mm -hmm. wanted the involvement of the rest of their, their citizens in the city and the rest of the businesses and, and you know, all of the four voices. And so we basically um, made purposive invitations to the thought leaders and uh, an open invitation to the public and then go back to the purposive invitations to the policymakers. So in that way, we kept kind of breathing in and breathing out, but always finding the energy for change. And then they started to notice it and it started to grow. One thing Durant did that was very, um, it turned out to be an extremely good strategy was they created something called Imagine Durant and had a board. Mm -hmm. And the board consisted of the three, four voices as well. And in the time that I was there, at the end of four years, we had gone through four, uh, gone through three city managers and three mayors. Mm -hmm. So if we had depended only on being in city hall, I doubt if the process had continued. Yeah, but no. because it originated outside city hall, but it always invited them in and included them. Mm -hmm. But it was because we had the four voices and the momentum was built and naturally. It, and who who finance because with processes like that, I mean this is this is wonderful to hear because it's like for, to me it's it describes this living the questions that is at the core of yeah. re-inhabiting place in a in a way that we we might have a future, but I in my experience what often stops processes like that from um, really getting going is that. Um, something needs to resource the initial catalyst, the people who, who are even just having the idea, we should possibly bring everybody together. How, like, we're going to call a meeting. Maybe we should talk to Marilyn and bring her wisdom into this story. Like, somebody needed to resource that. And how, how was that resourced? Because that's often <laughs> when it doesn't start. Uh, yeah, well, the resourcing at the beginning was interesting, as I mentioned. It was the president of uh, one of the largest community banks in, in the city mm -hmm. and the chief of the Choctaw Nation. Mm -hmm. They had both been doing personal leadership development. Mm -hmm. They had both really done the work and noticed their own change in themselves. And because of that, they took it mm -hmm. to organizational development. And they'd both been working with an organization you might have heard of in Texas called Stegan uh, out of Dallas. Who, who does all of this leadership and organizational development work using an integral frame. Mm -hmm. And when they asked about who does this work in community, um, you probably know Barrett Brown was one of the faculty and he said, oh, well, you should check with Marilyn Hamilton. She has, she's actually you know, started to do that work. So they called me up and, uh, and asked me to come. Uh, I was very skeptical at the beginning because mm -hmm. I was well aware that doing the work at the community and city level would be much messier, mm -hmm. much less controllable than either leadership or organizational development because everybody's a volunteer, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, but they um, chose to um, bring in their, their first um, board and they started to resource it by asking for the four voices all to contribute time, money and effort. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how we move forward, but always around energy. It wasn't like thou shalt. There yeah. was no, no, um, it, it was looking for the positive response and resonance and building on that and amplifying it. That, that's a lesson I learned from Margaret Wheatley early on. You know, if you want to improve the health of a system, connect it to more of itself. Mm -hmm. Find the energy and amplify it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I always do is I go looking for the energy. And it doesn't have to come from City Hall this way. It can mm -hmm. come from the citizens. It could mm -hmm. come from, oh, it could come from business. Mm -hmm. uh, it could come from, and in this case, it was a business person and a cultural leader. You mm -hmm. know, the whole, 
nation of the Choctaw Nation was was really they were they were instrumental in in starting being co-catalysts I would say with me. And what would you say like because that that energy work that you, of systemic energy work you're just referring to um, particularly in this day and age where where it seems to be a tendency towards polarization and people stop listening to each other because they just create their little categories and then the minute they, they hear a certain meme they just put somebody into the category and stop listening to that person um, so so it's so easy for those kind of public dialogues and inquiry pro, uh, processes to 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 have flashpoints where people stop moving forward for the sake of the whole for the care of creating mm -hmm. a healthier system and start going into conflict how how do you how do you work that like how you how do you guide energies so they stay generative and regenerative rather than degenerative and destructive well, that that's a good question and i think that um, part of the answer would come from, I never work on my own. Mm -hmm. So I um, called together a team. And in this case, once I found that there was energy in Durant, then I called together the first team to come and help me hold that very first um, set of dialogues with the, with the thought leaders. Um, and then we looked to find local leaders. So we were wanting to always make sure what, what we were doing was growing local capacity. Mm -hmm. So the capacity, um, and, and we were able to do that. And um, they started to generate, uh, started to become quite confident. Interestingly, the first uh, executive director of the um, Imagine Durant had never done any of this kind of work. Uh, and when we hired her, she had been doing um, smoke cessation, smoking cessation work for a bureaucracy. But so we knew she was working with health and we knew she could work with some pretty tough characters in the room because she was in an area that smoking was still very popular. And, um, but she'd never done any of this. So her first year she was in just sort of like almost uh, fear and terror. Could we carry this off? Could, but she just would follow the design that we had for this. And by the end of the first year, she could do it all. She could manage it all. She could call in the small group facilitators. And we started to find um, that for the initial meetings that there were, I, I, I was looking for as many um, local and American, especially um, facilitators to co-facilitate with me. Mm -hmm. So it was evident to people we were growing our own capacities. And I think the what prevented us from polarizing was we uh, were always asking another question I learned from Margaret Wheatley, and that was, who else should be here? Mm -hmm. Who else should be here? Because it isn't just us. Mm -hmm. So we would look for always pushing the envelope of uh, younger generations, older generations, uh, genders, um, interests, um, just as much diversity as possible. So we always built diverse diversity into the equation. And if it didn't show up, we purposively went after it. This is fascinating to me because I, I, I just last week I, I had a conversation with Bill Reed from Regenesis Group, and um, so much what you just described is really central to what working in a place-sourced regenerative practice way with a community is is, is all about. To really like. like building capacity you mentioned eh, is really at, at the heart or even in with bill i had this conversation that that the the first place is personal development which is both of, of yeah. oneself to to learn how to collaborate how to invite more pe people in how how to hold these processes but then to to also the next stage out is build the capacity of the team to do this work together and yeah. And, and that's really where most of the magic happens because then you create a self-perpetuating, like you build yes. the capacity to yes. To, to yes. Yes. rather than you, you oppose an idea, impose an idea of this would be healthier in this city, so let's do this. But it's a much slower process. Much slower. Um, but it's an evolutionary process that, that, that enables the system to heal itself and to, to evolve. But, but it sounds, for me, but what, what I just listening to you it was so interesting to see how there's a whole community out there learning regenerative practice. Yes. 
but then there's all this wealth in the community you're very connected with or the wider integral community that that have, have also done this kind of systemic work and i'm i'm just wondering how how do we increase learning to build bridges between these communities in ways that that really serve both of them and and serve the world serve that the higher purpose uh, yeah, so now you're coming into sort of, you know, flash forward 10 years. Yeah. Um, I, I will just give you a little completion around Durant because uh, so at the end of four years, we actually did the rest of those intelligences, which included putting together a strategic mesh worked plan. Mm -hmm. We were navigating 10, 20, 30 years forward. We knew what our purpose, they discovered their purpose. They were able to articulate their values um, and they knew they had to evolve at their own speed. And that was something I told them all along. I said I could not predict for them how fast this would be because it would depend on how fast their uptake was, how fast they could share together. So at the end of four years though, because they had this, and one of the things they were uncharacteristically good at, I say uncharacteristically because a lot of these systems are not good at um, strategic implementation, they were quite good at that. And so they said, uh, we think we can take this on now and, and we're going to go for it because we know the sort of goals and who's in going to be involved and what we're going to set for our first year, five year, 10 year intentions. And they, they had it all mapped out, but with enough wiggle room that they knew that they could go with, with the flow or go with, with shifts that, can, that, that would happen. So I was, I, I, I felt like we had achieved what they had wanted and they had the capacity to generate their own co internal capacity. Mm -hmm. Because of that experience and, um, you know, in other parts of my life, I would continue to write and talk about the integral movement and the integral worldview. Um, one of the things I became aware of was there's just so much capacity for building capacity in the integral movement. Could be coaching, could be facilitation. Um, your own work around regeneration, encountering Sean S. Fearn Hargens, and you know, looking at integral ecology, or uh, Mark Decay around integral sustainable design. Uh, I just thought, wow, these, this is really so interesting that we are able now to be um, offer our services in ways that we could accelerate change in the world theoretically. Mm -hmm but we tend to be spread out all over the place, not just in different cities, but all over the world. And so my fantasy has been, what would happen if we brought the leaders of all these integral specialties together and imagined that we were in one city? Mm -hmm. And of course, in this period of time, the whole challenge around climate change and other volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous aspects of our VUCA world have arisen, all the wicked problems. And so more than ever, I've, I've entertained this fantasy. Um, and I've, I've tried inviting others at, at conferences to convene that kind of um, conversation, and there's always been resistance. Um, I, I can't give you an answer why, but it's been very frustrating to me because on the one hand, I've been trying to take integral perspectives to a world that doesn't know anything about that way of looking at the world. And then when I come into the integral movement, there seems not to be an awareness, in particular around the city as a scale, as a scale of human systems. Because one thing I've noticed is integral tends to specialize at um, the individual development or leadership or um, the organizations, mm -hmm. and then it'll go to nations and the globe. And I keep saying, but there, there's actually a scale in between organizations and nations. Yeah, two, and, I would even say it. Like, there, there, there's just one, one question that, that I don't want to not ask, which is how do you see the relationship between the city and the region? Because for me, what I've learned by being at the lower scale, sp spending time at Findhorn, working with transition towns, looking at the kind of almost intentional community experiment type scheme, of can we create a sustainable regenerative system that really heals people and place? I I kind of got to see that 
that small community scale is too small to have the systemic integration to create the win-win-win with the environment. So, so really, um, the bioregional scale, the watershed the shed scale, within which, for me, the city sits, um, is, is, to my mind, where we can redesign the human presence on Earth. But of course, because now so many of us live in cities, for me, the relationship of energizing bioregional development and contextualizing urban city development in that way is one of the key challenges for the next decade. Um, and I, I would love to hear your take on, on city and region. Yeah, I, I actually, um, I see them completely as you just described. Okay. And um, it's probably um, uh, something like a Suzanne Tandu for me. Oh, I, you know, developed these ideas living in British Columbia, which mm -hmm. is part of the Cascadia watershed. Mm -hmm. And I was totally influenced in the um, 70s and 80s and 90s by the discourse that was going on around that whole set of watersheds mm -hmm. and uh, influenced by the First Nations ways mm -hmm. of actually dividing up their territories, which was by watershed. Mm -hmm. So it's actually implied in my work and explicitly written in the book that books that you have to in, mm -hmm. engage with with the eco regions. Mm -hmm. And more than ever now, I feel that is the only way we're going to be able to um, bring coherence to the city is if there is a deep reconnection with the eco region. Mm -hmm. I was just speaking at the um, Eco City World Summit in um, in Vancouver with um, with Bill Rees, who was, you know, the co-author of the um, the uh, Eco Footprint, yeah. and that also I was there at the very first workshop they ever gave, mm -hmm. and so that impressed me deeply. And I have never thought of cities outside the context of the eco regions. So, so remind, that, me, remind me, remind me, Bill Rees was Martin Matis Vata Bacana, yeah, supervisor, uh, supervisor at, at UBC, at, CG, at, at UBC. He developed the work with Bill at. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Just yes, to, yes. Uh, right. yes. Uh, yes. 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 Uh, yes. And then the other person what there was, uh, you know, Richard Register, who was the the, the person who originally, you know, coined the term eco city. So uh, I feel that they're absolutely inextricably linked. I don't actually separate the city from the eco region. Have you have you in your own because what what I always I mean this is this is where sometimes my academic background shows a bit that that I actually love going upstream in the in the history of all of this because there's sometimes so much wisdom to uh, to discover and and for me um one of the the real founding fathers of this impulse that i see both of us still working in um is is patrick geddes um and then patrick geddes is linked to jan christian smuts and and um holism and and how geddes is this interesting person who is a biologist who is at the same time accredited for being the founding father of town planning, but also very at the core of this, the, the founding of the discipline of sociology. Uh -huh. um, so so he, he envisioned the, the Edinburgh Festival um, and he brought people like Le Play and, and Heckel, the, the, the guy who coined the term ecology, uh -huh together in Edinburgh to bring this synthesis of knowledge, this map making of the, the wider picture. And then wrote this wonderful book that very few people um, read because it's like three volumes. Um, it, it's called I don't know, Life Towards a General Biology, um, which he co-authored with, with a professor at Aberdeen University. And for, for me, he had this vision that, that we're still trying to bring into the world, the world has taken up a lot more since then, but he was 120 years ahead of his time. Yeah, I agree totally. And I do see us <laughs> as, as his children. I, I was uh, introduced to Patrick Geddes by um, a city planner who I met in Canada, who's Scottish, who's now moved back to Edinburgh and is a, a fanatically devoted Patrick Geddes fan. So uh, once I came and uh, yeah, walked up and down the Royal Mile and uh, appreciated uh, all of um, all of Geddes, I had to actually go up to the top of the camera obscura and see what he saw there. And absolutely, I feel I feel like Ian that you just mentioned the the 
they, Ian, White? Yeah, Ian, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Ian White. Yes, 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 Ian White. Yes, wonderful man. Yeah. I'll, I'll say so. Um, we've been in, in he, and he's been inside the academy, the academy in Canada, yeah. and because I was always um, an associate ac ac academician out of uh, Royal Roads University, Ian could feed me all kinds of things that he just couldn't you know, push too hard in the academy, and I would go off and experiment with them. Yeah. Oh, lovely. I didn't know that you knew each other, but it makes perfect sense. Yeah, we're very close friends, very close friends. So, yeah, I go visit him in Edinburgh. Just because you mentioned the Outlook Tower, like, um, lately, through my, I was in, in, um, in March, I was in Brazil uh, launching my book in, in, in Portuguese there, and, and I met some people who were involved with the Museum of the Future in, in Rio de Janeiro. And then towards the end of the last year, um, I was in Barcelona, where a small foundation is also thinking about starting a museum of tomorrow. And, and somehow I've connected over the last two or three years to more and more people who are really living into this question, what is the role of um, cultural institutions and museums in the, the necessary public education and transformative process of, of basically creating platforms to have the kind of conversations you were just ex explaining with the, 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 the work you were doing in, um, was it in Oklahoma, you said? Yes. Yeah. Um, Geddes, again, was a visionary there with the Outlook Tower to basically make everybody in Edinburgh understand the scale linking, the, the, the fractal dimension of here's the world, here is Europe, here's England, here's Scotland, here's your city, and now you're at the top, and now have a look at your city with really high technology at the time, the camera of Yes, yes, and yes. But, but it, it, in, in one exhibition, people walked up that tower and had a nested sense of place yes. given to them in an in a, in a easily communicated way that educated people could go deeper, less educated people could just enjoy the experience and, 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 and still be very deeply affected by it. And, and I think we, that's, that's a big challenge for the, for the future as well, to, to unearth that part of, of kind of a, that Gadesian seed of how do we create culture? Because I also think that the Edinburgh Festival was that intention like this. He, he was trying to invite us back into synthesis yeah, just continued another hundred years. Yes, digging yes. into our silos and and with all the, the the negative side effects that 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 had, and of course it gave us a lot of interesting knowledge. But now yeah. we need to bring it back together again. And actually, so that that's really um, sparks me because mm. a number of integralists are are discovering Patrick Getty's totally, you know, without city planning background. And saying yes, there's there's been a in the um, Journal of Integral Theory and um, Practice an article oh. written on Patrick Geddes and early integrate integralists, oh. um, and your description of the Outlook Tower sort of is a way for me to say, well, that's what I would like to do is bring all the integralists together, mm -hmm. and say, what if we were in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. and um, we're now faced with all of these wicked problems and particularly climate challenges, how would we work together mm. so that we could offer the ways that the many new insights that we have around building capacity? How would we do that? Mm. Um, so uh, my invitation for this Urban Hub book is kind of like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out I actually also made the same proposal to the Integral Europe Conference. Mm -hmm. I hadn't put the two together until I started to send the invitations for the Urban Hub and I realized, oh, th these are actually just part of a trajectory that I'm trying to um, synthesize all this expertise in, in service mm -hmm. to cities and eco-regions. Mm -hmm. So when I finished writing that first book, which was had all of those intelligences, the last chapter was on evolutionary intelligence mm -hmm. and that chapter i realized that what i was really saying in a whole rest of the book was there was a, a code there's a, a master code that we can live by in service mm -hmm. um, to human systems and and um all that is and i call it uh to care for yourself mm 
you must care for yourself so you can care for others. And we care for others so we can care for our places. And together we can care for the planet. Mm -hmm. So like individual, others, self, mm -hmm. planet. And that together is is the master code. And and I I I even borrow from Aurobindo, and I think it's like an integral yoga. At the end of every day, I ask myself, how have I done that? How have I done that? Caring for self, others, place, and planet. I think it's it's interesting because it, it for me it's it's a it's a reframing, but of interesting reframing because of you you putting place in there in, in in that way because for like. I understood that the, the question of how do I serve self, community, and life or planet is, is really at the heart of almost all indigenous um, cultures. Like there is a master code that is how we as human beings have learned to live um, over millennia in, in a sensible way. Um, but, but by putting place in, particularly at this point in time, it's, it's, it's an invitation to reconnection to the earth, um, yes. which, which um, of course you could say is in the how do I serve planet or how do I serve life, but, but right now what we so need is that deeper reconnection. And um, so I, was, uh, I, I just saw that, and in general, I think your integral city site is an incredible piece of work. The, the, the layers and layers of mapping you've done and the synthesizing is, um, is really like, what I always ask myself is, I hope, like, I really hope that resources like that actually get the use that, what, because they offer so much, but there's so much out there that I'm often wondering, do, do people actually find the site and use it? Yeah. So is that a question? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 well, it's it's a question, and it's, but it's also a question for me. It kind of leads me to, to to another question I would like to to ask you, um, which is with this current sense of urgency, of unraveling, of more and more voices falling into a sort of apocalyptic tone about the future. Um, where, of course, we need to be realistic about to what extent we've committed already because of lag in the system of climate change and so on. We've committed to things getting worse, and they already have been getting worse so much faster in the last three, four, five years, which is why people are finally starting to wake up. But but in, in this context of this urgency, on this nice edge of... of where within one limited frame, within just one type of scientific analysis, you could say it's too late, possibly. Yeah? Yeah. Um, but since we know that there are many multiple frames and, and, and the system is much more complex and surprising than we could ever map, um, how, how yeah. do you, how do you, like, because you and I, like we've just talked about, wonderful important need for integration but how few people really care about that at this point in time um how many people are still out there caring about other things and and how how does that connect to how much time we've got left how, how do we become most effective in what we do well um great question and one i wrestle with all the time these days um so some of the inspirations you've already brought forward, I will say one place that I've always believed was important was Getty's um, Think Local, Act Global, no, Think Global, Act Local, mm -hmm. but people have reversed it that way. And you know, uh, our mutual friend Jude Kurovan has said, mm -hmm. think cosmic, feel global, mm -hmm. act local. And I feel it's very important for people to have uh, a local relationship with earth, with place, because mm -hmm. that's where their energy will be. I, I haven't stopped following the energy. Mm -hmm. So um, I feel that people care deeply for those people that matter to them and, and the earth. I think we see that rising. And of course, the media doesn't always play it out um, as is what's actually happening locally, like say with Extinction Rebellion, with the 
with the, the local people who have sort of built on all that years of work out of transition towns mm -hmm. um, and other other ways where the younger people have woken up and said um, we don't we don't accept this um, um, way of disrespecting the earth which is what they're pointing to basically corporations and capitalism as it currently exists how are we going to find our way out of here i think we all have to do it together I, and i have always thought that was one of the um, values and benefits of cities is because in the developed world 90 percent of us live in cities when we average it out across the whole world 60 percent of us live in cities and i think that that is where change is happening because it must cities are where we reflect our relationships and agreements on a day-to-day -day basis. But we also know as the um, one thing that globalization has enabled is most people ha have some idea that their food doesn't just come from the grocery store, but they must actually understand something about ecoregions uh, and or how far that food has been transported to land on their plate. So I feel that it's opening up the same kinds of conversations I've talked about before that allows people to be honest in what they do know and don't know and their fears, because unless you can allow um, the, the pain and the fear and the trauma in the room, um, then I think that it's very difficult to go forward. I see some really interesting people doing major work here. Thomas Hubel would be one of them. Mm -hmm. Monica Sharma is another. You ask me, does my website ever, you know, do, do people go to it? Well, they must because I have to say that 2019 was the year where I was not pushing my uh, itinerary. People invited me to come to parts of the world mm -hmm. I had never expected to go to. One of them was India. Mm -hmm. I just received an invitation to go to Korea. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I didn't seek either of those. Mm -hmm. And it was because people have found my work through either my books or the website or they found a blog or and so there's something out there that i think i would even bring into our conversation the, the spiritual reality of people seeking answers um not just in a gross realm but looking to other realms and i, I think those answers um and that kind of synthesis is also starting to emerge it's hard hard to be here in finthorn where we're celebrating co-founder Dorothy McLean's 100th birthday mm. and uh, look at how um, her very simple commitment to uh, living through love in a very practical way has impacted people around the world. Mm. Uh, I'm a radical optimist. In my darkest hours, that's what I remind myself and I come out and it keeps surfacing. I'm, I'm afraid I was just made that way. Mm. Um, and I, I do believe we will see a lot of change in the, in the near and um, however you want to measure the distance in the future. And I think we, will, I think we have the capacity to adapt to it. One of the other, I think, influences for both of us has been um, James Lovelock. Mm. I heard him being interviewed live in Canada about 10 years ago. And he said, after the interviewer had described how terrible humans have treated the earth, that he mustn't have a very high opinion of humans. And he said, on the contrary, he cut it right off. On the contrary, he says, humans are Gaia's reflective organs. Mm. I was so astonished, I almost drove off the road. I had to change all my slides because that's where I was going was to a conference. And it made me wake up to a whole other level of respect, responsibility, commitment. Wow, I've been evolved. I've been evolved to be Gaia's reflective organs. I think actually cities are the organs and we're the cells and the organs. But I think that's a pretty high, high calling. This, this is... The, if, so much i think of the changes that that the crisis is pushing in us now which is really like you've heard me say this at, at, at Findon when i gave this talk last year um that to some extent we've pushed 
life into like out of a relatively 10 year 10,000 year stable period where life had a had a pretty way of sort of stabilizing planetary co conditions um we've pushed it into an extreme of ecosystems collapse and possible runaway climate change and all of those things and in in that some something is reminding us that we are life that we're yeah. not separate from it that we're completely connected and dependent on it and we're starting to like i mean that's where the energy like i want you to panic comes from greta Thunberg. i don't think panic is the right energy to find a solution but but that, that initial kind of uh, it's getting at us is 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 a rite of passage is a pushing us to face our own mortality as a species and as life to a point where we where, where we're ready to to evolve and, and grow up and 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 part of it is like and this is where i also find a city so interesting is that in retelling our story rather than through the story of separation but through the story of that fractal nested interbeing of that understanding that we are actually the universe becoming conscious to itself yeah. we carry in us the the molecules forged in supernovas and that the, the the ring i've got on my finger made from gold needs the death of a star in order to create the molecules that make this possible but every cell in your body has elements in there that have been part of this huge story for eons and i always remember Joanna macy reminding me that if you if you step on stage and you and you do your work remember you are speaking on behalf of 3.8 billion years of life's evolution life is speaking through you you have the right to say what you need to say because you're saying it for the larger being eh? that really in a similar way as you just described really recontextualized it makes us more audacious and more humble um, yeah, both. at the same time um, yeah. And 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 I I feel like we're definitely called to trust that if consciousness is primary rather than matter, that if we because this is a I think where like we've now left it so far that there isn't a purely rational reductionist scientific way of getting out of this dead end that we're pushing towards unless we zoom out and understand that even that lens as useful as it is and as important as we should still use science very centrally we need to go beyond the limitations of our current scientific paradigm and understand that if consciousness is primary then the the way out of the current dead end is actually to bring forth the world differently and that means yeah. that we need to change our way of being rather yeah. than pr primarily and that will change the doing rather than constantly trying to adjust our yeah. doing without questioning the way we are the, the, yeah. the deeper yes and so that's where, where i feel like part of that and, and the, the city re-envisioning the city as an expression of life in a in a planetary and seeing that anybody who still tells you that evolution and life is about competition and scarcity and, and yeah. elbows out just look at the city like yeah. i always say this when i give talks i said say to people like look you, you're telling me that competition has shaped the evolution of life but then you're living in a city where if you if you like take a city like new york with eight or 15 i don't know how many people manhattan has these days but, but the the amount of murders and um violent interaction compared to the fact that that many people function as a super organism the, the roads work the, 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 yeah. the energy comes like all, all i mean with all the shortcomings around the edges the yeah there is a miracle it's a miracle of collaboration <laughs> first and foremost so yes. me, cities have a real emblem of of showing us that life is actually about collaboration and, and symbiosis um rather than competition um, uh, absolutely absolutely yeah and uh, um one of the other i think mutual friends that uh helped me to uh, affirm that was elizabeth saturis mm -hmm. so when we met each other 12 years ago 
or so. Um, you know, she was talking about the cell as the city, and I was talking about the city as the cell, and we realized, oh, fractals, different scales, and, and just had so much resonance around how she was seeing the city just as I was in traveling from 30,000 feet. Oh, wow, this is, this is what I call a meshwork. It's, it's actually, we can see the built form. And in fact, cities are the only human system you can actually see from space. You, you can't see the nation, but the cities you can see, you can see where the energy mm -hmm. has been amplified. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's so important for us to do just what you have described here, to bring that consciousness into complement the biology mm. and the systems that we created and i've i've said uh, for a long time my opinion was that new governance is not going to come from nations new governance will come from cities because we must create new governance in order to continue to be able to collaborate together and that's what elizabeth says We're, we are going through a species maturation process mm. and that this um false story about uh, the competition as being the only way forward, it, it has to give way to cooperation and collaboration. And she can point at the species all around the earth where this has happened again and again and again. So we are repeating a, a natural cycle mm -hmm. and our capacity for the consciousness and the culture to uh, become aware of our worldview, to become aware that we are consciousness, conscious of itself. Um, it is a miracle. It, it is a miracle. But for me, one, one thing that that brings me back to the to a, one of the deepest insights I got out of working with the integral map and with spiral dynamics um, by now, well, almost 20 years ago when I first really got into it, um, this insight that it is an evolutionary dynamic map that of course the, the big problem I always find with the integral community is that they they lose themselves in the frameworks of the theory and, and, and get rigid around that but that's a different story but but the developmental part of it like people who are in the second tier conversations very often fall into this trap of just trying to let's if let's lift everybody up into <laughs> yes. having this conversation and and not acknowledging that if this is an evolutionary process we need to have space for all the the, yes. the stages in it which means yes. there will be rednecks in the future too <laughs> but but how do you how do, how do you become a healthy place grounded earth loving life supporting redneck um and 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 like that's again that, that that's bad language or, or bad metaphor because I don't want to be respectful of rednecks in, in in the slightest. But but how do we create human systems where we see diversity? Like we're now learning the hard way that we're deeply dependent on the on biodiversity and the diversity of life, and that the species extinction will bring our extinction if we don't watch out. And since we're a complex species, yeah, we're going to yeah. be gone very quickly. The microbes are going to, and the mushrooms are going to pump back and yeah. bring Gaia back yeah. to life long after us. But, but the, the, um, how do we really work with all of our diversity of opinions and worldviews and perspectives in a constructive way that doesn't try to get into agreement? because yeah. we never get there, but honors disagreement and diversity in a way as the source of creativity and adaptability and vitality that will allow us to keep evolving into the future. But, but that shift at this point where there's such polarization seems to be so hard to, to make. It's, it's, it's easy to think of it intellectually, but, but it's, it's yeah. hard to... Uh, and that yeah, so you just raised something else that we agree on. Mm. That was uh, one of the things that um, I really appreciated from Claire Graves, who was the researcher behind Spiral Dynamics, who said, you must allow people to be who they are mm. at the stage that they are. And he was the first person that I know who really um, managed to see human systems development within the context of life conditions. Mm. So that meant um, both the cultural and the social and also the environmental life conditions, in my opinion. It wasn't always unpacked that way, but I always saw it that way. Mm 
and um, a lot of in, in, integralists don't, they forget about the life conditions piece, that we're co-creating life conditions as they're co-creating us. Mm -hmm. And that as you point out, that's why there is a chapter in the first book, I just published the second edition of that, kept that in there, about generations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people will evolve through their own lives, through these different stages. And I think that one of the ways that we might shift from polarities is to go back and reclaim at a new level of complexity some of the practices from tribes who had life passages through these different stages and celebrated them so that there was healthy red. As you say, it's going to happen. So they had ways of bringing uh, young people into their manhood or womanhood. And they had rites of passage where they learned both the energies of that value system and that capacity. And that made them ready for when they would move on into a more complex system. Mm. Um, and the thing that cities offer us is very co the, the large cities you mentioned new york well i was in in delhi in in india 26 million people mm. and i was really curious what i would see there so I, I was looking for a lot of diversity i was quite surprised at how modern the city is because i had all kinds of ideas and stereotypes in, in my mind but also looking at the different layers of the ways that people lived um in their habitats on the streets uh, with the different transportation systems, how I would say globalization has really impacted and destroyed a lot of flow in the culture and sped it up to such levels of um, risk and threat that it, it's truly for somebody who doesn't live there on a regular basis, um, very uh, causing me to live on the edge of my seat. You've been there, you know that. <laughs> I, I once took a tuk-tuk from Konot Circus to the Sada Bazaar area of Delhi, and it was probably like my my adrenaline levels were never. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, but but within cities, uh, whether it's New York or Delhi, um, the, the cities where there is so many cultures um, mixing, mm. we're having to find diversity not in just how we make decisions for the whole but how those um, decisions are made for um, the smaller parts of the whole, where we still have groups of people who want to stay together because that's their choice. Mm -hmm. But in the city, they have to figure out how are we going to live here while this very different group of people lives here. Uh, and I think cities will continue to be uh, a place where uh, if we don't get integration, we'll, we'll get all kinds of um, synthesis that some of which we can't even imagine now some 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 will be uh, will create whole new convergences because people will decide they they will come together but I think we'll see um, quite much more of what I would call an ecology of cultures mm. that we'll find it like a forest has a, a, a million niches and mm. I think that a city uh, even if we just looked at, say, a modern city, it has that. That's what makes it work: is the capacity to share labor and find niches uh, that allow us to grow. But I think we're going to find that will um, intensify, intensify even more. And so, if we, I, I, I would agree. And I'm just thinking: how do you impose the enabling constraints of living within a planet? biophysical boundaries yeah. on systems that you also want to be as diverse in their expression and, and, and cultural exploration as possible. Um, and and with, within that is also the qu question of, do we just accept that technology has been created in such a way so far that it has almost become an autopoetic runaway system that that we're now running after rather than 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 guiding or do we understand that since all technology is ultimately a human intention turned into some form of design process like machinery and so on that we also have the potential of choosing not to use certain of technology because that's like there's a bifurcation never yeah. mind the, 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 the physical danger of of life unraveling there's also a technological danger of 
us bifurcating into a different type of technologically enhanced species that that might create some opportunities but will also kill a lot of what evolutionary life has been about so far yeah you know, i think that's one thing that cities as a whole are tend to still be very disconnected with and that is that i believe they have a responsibility to their bioregion so, and this is, I think, in most cities everywhere, there's no awareness that they have a responsibility to know where their energy, literally their, um, their, their foodstuffs energy and lifestuffs energy is coming from and how to re replenish it. So one of the other things we haven't mentioned is that I call cities human hives. Mm -hmm. And I have learned from the biomimicry study of bees particularly honeybees, that they actually have a double sustainability loop. So they have organized the hive so that they produce their 20 kilograms of honey a year. And that's where the four voices come from. The four voices that I use in the city, I have learned from the bees. Um, and in order to do that, though, they pollinate the ecoregion. And as they pollinate, they are actually creating energy for next year. So the pollination process serves them for the energy now, but also the energy in the future. And the pollination serves all of the rest of the ecology that their hive exists in. And that, I think, is the set of principles that I think cities need to learn. I think Yetis knew that. I think that was one of the, he also loved bees. Yeah. And I think he pointed to the same kinds of well, relationship. Could, could you just briefly repeat the four voices because you've mentioned them a number of times and, and just also for if, if other people listen to it to, to, to bring them back into people's awareness. Yeah, so the four voices in the city are the citizens yeah. and in the beehive, those are the forager producers. Mm -hmm. um, in the city, the second voice is the civic manager. So that's like everybody, city hall, education, health, um, public works, emergency, fire, police. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the beehive, we would call those resource allocators. Mm -hmm. um, the third voice are, I call them business innovators, but innovators of all kinds. And in the beehive, they're called diversity generators. They're mm -hmm. actually intentionally there to bring in innovation and, and source new uh, sources of energy. And then the fourth voice in the city is the third sector or civil society. And in the beehive, I think that's actually the inner judges or the hive mind. And the, and the, the hive mind uh, and the resource allocators in the beehive are the ones that tell us, tell the hive, are we on track to produce our 20 kilograms of honey? But in so doing, they also are enabling that um, double loop of, of sustainability to go on. So, those are the four voices in the city citizens civic managers business innovators and civil society and so they don't, they don't, they, because initially you know that there's this whole movement around the fourth sector networks which work with the kind of traditional business sector public sector um and ngo sector and then they, they call the fourth sector the the people who who like in a nutshell definition use the tools of the business world to address the problems that the private sector, uh, the public sector isn't addressing effectively, um, but with the ethics of the third sector, the, the NGOs and, and civil society. Um, have, you, have you ever come across people confusing those four voices and the four sectors? Um, no, I haven't yet because I haven't been in a, a, a discourse like that, but I would say that's very interesting because I am noticing that um, oftentimes two or three of those voices are turning up, mm -hmm. sometimes four, and mm -hmm. slightly different variations on them because people have, you know, uh, they, they've maybe uh, developed them from a rational um, analysis. As I said, I was inspired through a biomimicry to say, mm -hmm. oh, I, I think this, is, this pattern that the bees have actually exists at the city. We just don't see it. We don't use that pattern, but I started to call it, I started to call the voices together around the same table, mm -hmm. and I noticed the difference, a and the difference prevented the polarization, mm -hmm. because the bees are serving the health of the individual, mm 
as well as the health of the whole. Mm -hmm. um, the city needs to do both that and the health of the ecoregion and mm -hmm. the health of the planet. That's why that layers of the master code really mm -hmm. matter. Yeah, no, I, I see how I, it's, it's so interesting. Of, of course, you'd expect that, but learning and deepening into the kind of regenerative practice work that that is curated and held by by the Regenesis Institute by, by Ben Haggard and Pamela Mang and um, uh, Bill Reed and, and <clears throat> all, all these wonderful people I've I've recognized so many of my own frameworks that I've put together and integrated and synthesized over the last 20 years and and felt a real parallel evolution and the similarly, as I listened to you and, 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 and as I was navigating the Integra City website, I, I realized, wow, um, like there's, we, we could talk for weeks um, <laughs> we and still, still have lots of points of deepening because it is a fractal thing. Um, yeah. We could dive off in every direction, but this has been, been incredibly rich. Um, but before we finish, um, you briefly mentioned this, this Urban Hub series and you, you had invited me to contribute some something to it in in the next edition um can you tell a little bit more about that project because what you're already on on the 12th edition or some something like that um, oh well yes yeah, so well this this urban hub series uh, is actually now they've produced the 19th one we're going to get the 20 will be urban hub 20 which i think is a beautiful nice symmetry 20 i'm looking for 20 contributors in 2020 um for urban hub 20. so this series was created by paul van shake so uh, Paul Van Shaik is um, his organization, Integral Mentors. He's been working um, as one of the earliest integral practitioners. His first um, organization, I think, is called I Shake, and, and I, I remembered seeing it on Ken Wilber's website and, and in discussions with him very early on. Mm -hmm. Paul is also the co-founder of Integral Without Borders, so he works with uh, Gail Hochachka and looking at how to bring Integral and in, often into places in the developing world. But Paul is also an architect, mm -hmm. and uh, so he decided that his writing would be mostly graphic, or at least 50% graphic in focus, and he created a series of graphic books, and um, he's published them so that they're all free and downloadable on the issue uh, website. Um, and you can also get a hard copy if you want off of Amazon. Um, but I've contributed to four or five of them, and he's brought different themes together and different practitioners from around the world. And the basic layout of the book is very, makes it very appealing. I write, you know, very long narratives in my books, but uh, Paul looks that 50% of the message be graphic mm -hmm. and 50% be narrative. Mm -hmm. And so how we invite contributors is, could you give us six PowerPoint slides? Because that's actually how we produce the book. Mm -hmm. um, and 50% of your slides, it can be each slide or however, it wish, however you wish to allocate it, um, bring, bring your message um, in a way that will be graphically appealing for readers and, and not just the meaning that you're making in the words. Um, so... When Paul, I shared Paul with Paul my fantasy about bringing all the integralists together for one city. Like I said, what, what if that happened? We could, we could take a topic like climate change and, and how would we all serve that? And he looked at me and said, well, why don't you curate an urban hub to do that? Mm -hmm. So uh, I took that on. And when I started to think about it, the first major frame to curate around was the master code. I mm -hmm. thought, well, I will invite people who are thinking about planet, people thinking about place, people thinking about capacity development in others and thinking about capacity development in individuals and ask them, what if you were all together in one city, what would you contribute to building capacity so we could meet climate challenge? I, I chose climate as, as sort of the example. So um, you're one of the people I invited to contribute at the planetary scale. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think in our discussions, you also obviously have a great heart for place. Um, yeah. And you uh, obviously are well 
practiced in, in seeing the fractal patterns. So I would love it if you could distill from this conversation some of the comments that you were making about the importance of city to relate to ecoregion, to relate to watersheds, uh, and show how that contributes on a planetary scale. Mm -hmm. You might want to borrow from Gettys. I, I would be very happy for, for that to turn up in the book. I, I have contributors from all of the other um, scales in the master code. So I, I think it's going to be, I think we're going to have our, our 20 for 2020. And I had another piece of synchronicity happen. I've been appointed to be a fellow of the uh, urban arena uh, who are looking at sustainability and justice over the next two years, revisiting about 400 different research projects and seeing if we can bring them together and, 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 and offer them forward to European cities. And while I was sharing the Urban Hub project with a woman from Lisbon, it turned out they have a really nice integral group of thinkers in Lisbon, and they volunteered their city to be a target city for like, okay, what you bring in for the Urban Hub, we'll look at and see how we could do that in, in Lisbon. Because mm -hmm. I think that if we do this in the one, you know, it'll be in, in the Urban Hub 20, that it'll become like a prototype. Mm -hmm. At the Ontario Europe Conference, uh, we're going to have the U theory as mm -hmm. one of the, and, and that's one of the final things that you do with the U theory, Otto Sharman's work, is you come up with a prototype. Mm -hmm. So, in effect, I think we'll produce a prototype that could be used at any city or village, even, because I imagine we can use this thinking back in Finhorn, even. Mm. And Lisbon is willing to take it on as sort of a, a first trial and see what see what they can learn from what we could pull together. What's the timeline? You said the deadline for contributions end of January. <laughs> yeah, that that when my invitation went out in December, I was targeting the end of January. Yeah, I'm open to a little bit of negotiation if you need it. But. And and the and the the book is it because in that way you could probably produce it relatively. Quickly, is it, it because it is. this year, 2020, Lisbon is city of um, culture or something? Yes, it is. Yes, as another synchronicity. Yes, I didn't know that when, when they came forward. Yes, the, the book will be produced by April. Okay. Uh, I will be taking it to the Integral Europe Conference in May. So, yes, this is one of the wonderful things. Paul, having done 19 of them, mm -hmm. has a very strong idea of just exactly how to do the production. And because um, they're first produced as ebooks, then then they're also all downloadable by everybody. And that that's also makes it wonderfully yeah, accessible. That's so much better. Well, I'm looking forward to writing a, a piece and feel feel free to critique the first one if it, like because you have a more editorial understanding of how yeah. Yeah. Know, if, yeah. it, if there's something that you expected me to put in missing when you get the piece, let me know and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what, what we can do. <laughs> okay, well, that, that's a wonderful uh, invitation back to me because I'm also remaining quite open. Um, mm. This will be an example of living with diversity in the city mm. because I won't know exactly how it should all be curated until I see everybody's mm -hmm. contributions. So yeah. I'm learning. I have my first one already on mindset, which was really wow. a nice contribution to come in very quickly. And um, yeah, so I will get back to you if I have any questions. And I just anticipate a lot of energy because that's what I feel from you. <laughs> Thank you so much for this time. And, and like part of me could, could easily continue for another hour, but I think um, maybe we'll do another time. <laughs> rather. We will, we will. So, this so has been uh, lovely. Have a, have a wonderful beginning to the year and, and um, yeah, enjoy those quiet times at Findhorn. Um, and, and I always find this is a special time before the year really gets going. It's maybe another week or so where you can, like I certainly allow myself most exploration of, of, of sort of the, the passions and the creative impulses that, that are wanting to be brought into the year that, that I might miss out on if i don't um give them attention now um yes yes so yeah it's yeah. i love this time of the year so yeah, wonderful thank you so much for for our conversation and, and thank we'll you my email as well okay thank you bye, -bye. bye now Thanks.
Uh, where's, now I have to end the recording.